Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody and welcome to this side event at the UN Forum on Forests on Turning the Tide on Deforestation. Thank you everyone for joining us from around the world. My name is Tim Christofferson. I work at the UN Environment Program where I head the Nature for Climate branch. I'm also a focal point for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Thank you for FAO to bring us all together as the chair of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. Today we'll be hearing about joint messages from all the key international organizations working on forests. So this is an exciting moment when we have joint messages for all of us and you and the world at large here at UNFF on halting deforestation. We will have a panel um, that will look at this from different perspectives. I would like to note that this session is being recorded and we would like to encourage all of you to post questions in the chat in the event that we don't have time to come to your question before the end of the event. The FAO team has kindly offered to follow up on questions that are being posed. Forests, as you know, are key to the sustainable development agenda. We lose, however, still 10 million hectares of forests each year, an area about the size of Portugal. So it is high time that we turn the tide on deforestation. How do we do that? And what are the most critical areas to address? That is the theme of today's event. And the role of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests is essential in uniting the voices of all the international agencies working on this. And when all the international experts and the science speaks with one voice on an issue, the world does listen. And this is the case today, where we launch these joint messages on forests that will hopefully also help the UK government to host COP26, the Chinese government to host the Convention on Biodiversities, COP15, all the other key meetings that are coming up in the next few months and years where forests will be on the agenda. We have an exciting panel lined up and before I get to the panelists, we have a keynote address from a special guest, Lord Zach Goldsmith, was Minister for the Pacific and the Environment in the United Kingdom. And Zach Goldsmith will set the scene for us on turning the tide on deforestation. So please, if we can have the keynote address from Zach Goldsmith. Hello, it's a pleasure to be able to say a few words about what is undoubtedly a defining challenge of our age. And I won't rehearse all the facts and figures of destruction as you will be depressingly familiar with them. And today's joint statement is a powerful contribution to a huge and growing body of evidence telling us that we're heading for disaster. But you don't need to be a scientist, an expert or even an economist to understand the fundamental importance of forests, or that if current trends continue, we will pay a truly terrible price. Indigenous people have been sounding that alarm for decades. And although the poorest suffer first as the free services that nature provides and on which they depend most directly begin to fail, none of us can insulate ourselves from the effects of degrading the natural world. Forests, for instance, underpin the livelihoods of a billion people, yet we continue to lose them at a rate of 30 football pitches every minute. More than half the world's agricultural land is now degraded, and the diminishing yields are affecting 500 million small farms already. And in a vicious cycle, agriculture, forestry and land use are now the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after energy. And we know climate change means wildfires, drought, floods, crops failing, pests thriving, sea levels rising. And to make matters worse still, we know that our broken relationship with the natural world, habitat destruction, the illegal wildlife trade, industrial farming, increases the likelihood of deadly zoonosis like COVID-19. So there can be nothing more important than turning this trajectory around. And the good news is that we can. 
a nature restoration and nature protection works for people and for the planet. And the magic of focusing on protecting and restoring the diversity, abundance and connectivity of life on Earth is that in doing so, we're also tackling hunger, poverty, pollution and, of course, climate change. In fact, it's impossible to tackle any of these issues properly without helping nature recover. Now, globally, nature can pro provide around a third of the most cost-effective solution to climate change. And with every dollar invested in forests and mangroves, paying its way up to six times over. And I encourage anyone in need of inspiration to look at Costa Rica. They've managed to double their rainforest cover in a generation, putting more than half their country under canopy and growing their economy alongside their nature. Or Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire, who've managed to halve the rate of forest loss in just one year to 2019 from a high initial rate. So change is possible, as the joint statement makes clear, but the action we're seeing at the moment is nowhere near enough. And we need to raise global ambition and finance fast. So as presidents of the G7 and COP26, we're putting nature at the heart of our response to climate change. And we're urging governments around the world both to increase their international climate finance and to spend more of it on nature. We're calling on the multilateral development banks to mainstream nature across their entire portfolios and to support countries in fulfilling their commitments, essential to achieving the ambition of the Leaders' Pledge for Nature to put biodiversity on a road to recovery by 2030. And we're asking countries to join us in shifting land use subsidies away from destruction and towards supporting good environmental stewardship and to work with us to clean up the global commodity supply chains that are responsible for vast deforestation. We're leading global alliances to protect at least 30% of the world's land and ocean by 2030 and because we know there will never be enough public money available. We are supporting efforts to get private finance flowing as well. So we're establishing global frameworks for climate and nature related financial disclosures uh, to help businesses understand and reduce environmental risk. And we're also working with international partners to help draw together guidance on high integrity voluntary carbon markets that will benefit uh, people, climate, nature. And we're proud to work with others to shape the future of the exciting LEAF Coalition. We've had countless forest declarations and deadlines have come and gone, and yet deforestation continues apace. So we hope and believe that this collaboration between governments and businesses will be the largest ever commitment of finance for protecting tropical forests, and that it will genuinely move the dial on deforestation. And all this will help front runners in the race to zero and will inspire others to raise their game. And as Professor Dasgupta's seminal study explains, that's really the heart of it, the need to reconcile our lives and our economies with the natural world on which we all depend. At this point, none of us can say that we're doing enough. But turning this trajectory around is the UK's top international priority, and we welcome the leadership that the new US administration is clearly willing to provide. We have an opportunity now to make this the year we catalyze a decade of meaningful action and to fundamentally reset our relationship with the natural world. The UK is committed to working with you to achieve that. Thank you for what you do. Tim, we can't hear you. How's this? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, there was just a time delay and unmuting, it seems. Thank you very much for the very clear call to action from the UK government, from Lord Zach Goldsmith, who of course is also central in preparing the Climate COP26. And uh, without uh, further delay, I would now like to hand over to none other than Matthew Wilkie, who is, as many of you will know, 
the Director of Forests at the FAO Forestry Division and also the Chair of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. Mette, please over to you to tell us what are these joint messages on forests, what's in them? Thank you very much, Tim, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm really pleased to see so many of you here where we're trying to launch the CPF joint statement on challenges and opportunities in turning the tide on deforestation. But before I start, maybe I should just introduce at least the Collaborative Partnership on Forest. There may be some who are listening in who haven't heard about this before. Uh, this is a collaborative partnership, a voluntary partnership between 15 major forest related organizations or organizations that have a major area of work on forest. And they've been working together since uh, 2001 in support also of the United Nations Forum on Forest. Let me go straight to the point. Deforestation jeopardizes climate stabilization, biodiversity conservation and rural livelihoods. Since 1990, we have lost 420 million hectares of forest through deforestation. That's an area that's a lot bigger than the country of India. We know that forest and land use account for 11% of greenhouse gas emission, and that's primarily through deforestation. We also know that forests are heavily de degraded and only about 40% of them still have a very high level of integrity and they're affected by forest fires every year. But in terms of livelihood, we also know that about a third of the world's population are highly dependent on forest and forest products. 2.4 billion people use wood to cook their daily meals. Around 1 billion people depend to some extent on forest foods. But we also know that human health and forest health are very closely related. Forest destruction and fragmentation increases the risk of transmission of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. The rate of deforestation is going down. That's the good news. It's gone down from 16 million hectares per year in the 1990s to 10 million hectares per year in the last five years. But that's still twice the size of Costa Rica. We just heard how they had managed to change their forest area around. So the responses to deforestation are lagging behind and they must be accelerated. There are multiple and very strong international commitments to halt deforestation. We have a sustainable development goal on that. We also have the New York Declaration on Forests from the private sector, but there's been a failure to comply and to achieve those commitments. Very few countries have met their bond challenge commitment to restore degraded forests and forest lands. And while reduction of emissions from deforestation and forest degradation is included in more than 50 national determined contribution of countries, unfortunately, it's not backed up by finance. Only about 2% of climate finance for investment in land-based mitigation measures. We also know that the corporate responsibilities have increased, but they need to include more companies and there need to be better accountability. And while progress in legality of timber production and trade has improved a lot, we still have illegal flows valued at between 50 and $150 billion per year. So we need to scale up action to halt deforestation and forest degradation. And as I mentioned, we have a target on the Sustainable Development Goal 15. And it actually is one where countries have come together and decided that by 2020, we would halt deforestation and restore degraded forests. We clearly haven't met that target. And if we look at the results of FAO's Global Forest Resources Assessment, it also shows us that we are not likely to meet that target by 2030 unless we scale up action. So the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, is already on board. He is speaking out very loudly and saying we must halt deforestation, restore degraded forests, and change the way we farm. 
We are heeding that call and actually within this collaborative partnership on forest, all the members have been doing a lot over many years to help support countries decrease the rates of deforestation and forest degradation. And back in 2018, we came together and had a global conference to work across sectors to halt deforestation and increase forest area looking to see how we can work with other sectors and looking at how to address the drivers of deforestation. Then in 2019, that's when we had the call from the UN Secretary General, but he also asked FAO and UNEP to lead a concerted effort of UN agencies to halt deforestation and forest degradation. We decided to involve a bigger partnership, the Collaborative Partnership on Forest in that endeavor. And as part of that in 2020, we worked together to identify what are some of the key messages, what are some of the evidence behind this. And as part of that, we have now got this joint statement on the challenges and opportunities in turning the tide on deforestation. And you will hear much more about that tonight, or this morning, depending on where you are, uh, from our other panel speakers. But of course, that's only a first step. We also want to enhance collective action. And we are convinced that collective action can turn the tide on deforestation. We need to do three things. We need to transform our food systems to halt deforestation since 73% of all tropical deforestation is caused by agricultural expansion. Secondly, there are a number of different underlying drivers of deforestation and also from other sectors, and they need to be better understood and taken into account. And thirdly, and this is the big one, we need to act coherently at different levels and in different fields. And there's a range of actions that we need to take, and you will hear more about those later. But very importantly, we need to have increased policy coherence in countries. We need to have better governance, we need to have participation of stakeholders in finding the solutions. We need to have very clear policy and legal frameworks and including secure land tenure. We need to have reforms of our fiscal instruments and agricultural subsidies and to send stronger market signals about the value of standing forests. We need to enhance the corporate responsibility and accountability and to seek appropriate public and private funding, including but not limited to climate finance. And clearly we need to come up with some innovative solutions and synergies between agriculture and forestry, for example. And lastly, we need to have that global partnership and cooperation. Nobody can do this on their own. That's why the collaborative partnership is doing this together and in support of countries and their efforts. So, here again, you have the 15 organizations. We have a number of issues that we will be dealing with uh, taking up as part of a joint initiative to turn the tide on deforestation. And I'm sure there will be a lot of discussions about how we can best do that. And we're really looking forward to your questions and also to your suggestions on how we can provide a more coherent support by all of these organizations together. The Joint statement is now available at our website and I'll encourage you to have a look at it and you will hear more about it in, in a little while. I just want to say thank you so much for being with us today and for listening in and as we say we are hoping that you will be very actively participating in this session and give us your ideas as well. Thank you very much. Mette, thank you so much. And also, thank you for staying well within time, which gives me the opportunity to ask you a little follow up question. Um, first of all, thanks to the FAO team who already uh, on the chat posted the link to where you can download this statement as of now. And there was a request to also make your presentation available, Mette, which I'm, I'm sure is also not a problem for the CPF um, team and FAO. So, in in the CPF, we have the Rio conventions, we have the World Bank, we have, um, you saw all the logos, IUCN will speak later, the Jeff will speak later. Um, so what can we do as the CPF to support member states? Really, what are the concrete actions that are most important for us as the international organizations to 
really turn the tide on deforestation? That's a good question, Tim. And as you know, many of these organizations are already doing a lot. There's a lot of individual initiatives, projects in place, some of them together with a couple of the partnership members and some of them by the individual organization. What we really need to do is to look at where we are working and how we can increase the synergy, but also looking at what are the gaps? What are the perhaps the areas that we haven't looked at yet uh, and how we can work together to make sure that we step up our support there so that we can provide that coherent support to countries. So one of the first steps we're going to do is basically to map what each of the organizations are doing uh, and trying to see also in what geographies that they are working to see how we can make sure that we don't just tackle one of the topics that we looked at, but all of them in a coherent manner. So that's going to be the first step of what we do. And at the same time, looking at what are these critical gaps that perhaps we don't have dealt with yet that we can find out which is the best organization or how we can do that, that together. And of course, speaking with a common voice, as you say, will also make sure that perhaps more people are listening, uh, making sure that we get that evidence out, those solutions out on how to, how to tackle that. And so that would be some of the tasks that we have ahead. We will put together sort of a, a plan of what it is that we can provide of support to countries and make sure that we share that. Uh, for comments and and uh, and suggestions for how to further improve that. So very open to suggestions also from here today and, and further when we launch it. Thank you very much, Mette. And with that, we're now coming to a panel that will dive a bit deeper into how this can actually be done. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for this event. We have Roslyn Fosua Ajay, who is Director of Climate Change at the Forestry Commission in Ghana. Pascal Martinez from the Global Environment Facility, where he's the Senior Climate Change Specialist. Adriana Vidal is Senior Forest Policy Officer at IUCN. And Maria Del Mar Moso Muriel, I hope I pronounced your name more or less uh, correctly, Maria, is Director at the Directorate of Forest Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services of Colombia. So an exciting panel, various different viewpoints towards a joint goal of halting deforestation. And I would like to start with Rosalyn. And uh, first of all, thank you for joining us from Ghana. Um, I like a sticker that my children have, which says, save planet Earth. It's the only planet with chocolate. <laughs> so, um, of course, Ghana is uh, an important country for forests, but it's also an important country for many of the agricultural commodities that can come into conflict with forests. So in your perspective from Ghana, what is uh, the what has been the success and lessons from Red Plus in halting deforestation? And how can we maybe even more focus on the supply chain approaches and private sector action. And maybe COCO is one area where this might work. Rosalind, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. And um, greetings from Accra, Ghana. Um, I, it's good to connect with everybody um, in these sort of interesting times. And um, to move straight to the question and also to acknowledge um, the words that have already gone ahead in this particular webinar, um, quite strong um, words and messages. Some we have heard over time um, and also getting to know that there are country examples of what is working. And um, today I bring to bear what we are also doing in Ghana. I mean, the Red Plus mechanism, to me, I see it as very phenomenal because it encompasses all that we are talking about. We are not just addressing deforestation and forest degradation or enhancing carbon stocks before you can even understand the full scope of what your red class actions are. First, you would have to do your assessment of the drivers of deforestation, which are in most cases beyond the forestry sector. So then the issues of cross-sectoral policy coordination and coherence, that's coming because you can't achieve success in any red plus intervention when you are not linking up with the other sectors, particularly agriculture. And then you get into what we are doing in Ghana in terms of linking our red plus actions with the 
commodities we find in our landscapes. So we have an entry point to invite and involve private sector. Because in all that we talk about sustainable financing, Sometimes we hear it, it's become more like a rhetoric, but it's an issue. If you don't have sustainable financing, you don't expect to push any of these interventions, no matter how good they are. And when I talk about sustainable financing, it's not just about the quantum um, of the funds that are coming in, but even channeling the funds to the right um, interventions also does contribute to how sustainable that funding will be because you can use funding in such a way that it revolves and also um, invest and gives you return that you still invest into the interventions you are engaged in. And that's where private sector comes in. So in Ghana, in our landscapes, we, are, we have developed our plus interventions, our key commodities like cocoa, like share, that gives us share butter because there already is just a chunk of private sector financing we just talk about realignment to ensure that the practices now are climate smart. And it's not just about the financing bits. It's also about the fact that for you to achieve success in any red plus intervention, you must involve the grassroots um, people, people who are in touch with the very resources we are talking about. So communities, farmers um, within the landscapes, understanding what it was 10, 30 years, 20 years before, and what it is now, and coming to terms um, together to understand that climate change is happening, there are implications going forward, and the fact that they have to rise up to the occasion and own whatever process that comes on board. And this is what we have done in Ghana. I believe that Red Plus gives us a very good platform. One, the whole process of readiness. I joined um, the Red Plus process in 2008, right when Ghana went into readiness. The whole process of readiness, building the strong frameworks for governance, for carbon accounting, for feedback and grievance redress. It gives us a lot of learning. We've done this for 10 years. I believe we have the right lessons. We have the best practices. At this stage, what I see that we need is how to package all this and to get needed attention, more visibility, to expand the scope of implementation. Because for all that we are talking about, no matter how much Ghana does, if it doesn't have any effect on what is going on in other countries, we will not see the impact at scale. And that is the sort of impact we want to see. Every country should be able to come to some appreciable level of significant impact for us to know that, yes, this is working. We are curbing deforestation. We have tangible, verifiable um, impacts that we can measure and we can claim any benefits for. And um, it has been quite phenomenal for us here, having two key programs now, one resource-based, um, one also uh, that's with the carbon fund, that's in the cocoa sector, one also with the green climate fund on the share landscape, complementing each other, helping us address issues on safe gas to do with leakage and displacement, because these are two different ecological landscapes in the country. We are not drifting uh, or enhancing movement of people across because we are building programs in different landscapes that help to empower the communities and also make a business case on how they can enhance the commodities for themselves. And we don't just focus on private sector outside. We also focus on private sector within because they have the power to use their networks to influence change. And I believe there's a story that together with what other countries are doing, we should be able to package as the CPF and champion this and uh, move this forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Rosalind. Very clear and strong mes messages there um, that Ghana is very clearly ready after 10 years of readiness, and hopefully so are many others. Your point on international collaboration and joint action is also very important, as is the point on finance and uh, including smallholder finance, channeling the finance to those who most need it. So clearly ready to scale up is the message from Ghana. I, uh, If we have time, I might come back to you later um, on this point of international collaboration, but let's first uh, hear from the other panelists. So um, Pascal Martinez at the Jeff. Pascal, um, you uh, the question to you will not come as a surprise because it's about funding. The Jeff is the um, is the global funding mechanism for some of the key conventions uh, that have to do with forests. So um, what type of new or additional funding mechanisms or ways to channel funding, as we just heard from Rosalind, could be developed to help transform this field of fighting against deforestation. 
we've been talking about this for many years. So what are the what are the ideas that are new now and that can really help us to turn the tide? And how can the CPF support Jeff and countries in doing that? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for your question. Actually, it's a tough question because if we if we knew uh, the solutions, maybe we, we would have resolved the problem. I think that there is a very important uh, issue that we can uh, we can we can discuss uh, some key elements because uh, when you look at the the very good state CPF statement uh, that uh, Matt just just spoke about, we really can see that. We have many, we have well identified the problems and there is uh, already uh, a good vision of the possible solutions and challenges. Uh, so if I may, I would like to maybe to highlight some, some, some key issues here that uh, could help uh, maybe accelerate um, the transition and the change that, that we need. First of all, I think it has already been, been said by, uh, by the, the Minister of, uh, of, of UK, uh, it, it's about the, the value of nature. It's very key that uh, maybe a central element to, to, to recognize the value of nature and, uh, and prioritize uh, um, the nature as the main foundation on, on, on which economic and social activities depend on. I think there is no, no other way and maybe it's a starting point. Um, and then also, uh, and, and I'm very happy to have, to have listened to so to Rosalind before, because uh, we actually work with Ghana on, on a very strategic program, and maybe I could discuss this uh, a bit further afterwards. But uh, it's it's very the question of uh, of this um, the promotion of the integrated approach and mainstreaming forest uh, as forests provide many environmental benefits, and they also are the crossroad of many different economic, social, and competing uh, interests. That there's a need to be. Uh, to have a very holistic uh, and integrated uh, view of uh, and consideration of, of forest, and here to 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 to, to speak about uh, the financial mechanism that you you are mentioning, Tim. Uh, I think that one there are already many uh, funding mechanisms uh, uh, and initiatives, uh, and maybe there is something that should which can try to further develop is the mobilization of domestic resources. I think it's key because um, it might not, the, the finances might not be the limiting factors. Uh, we certainly need to increase the mobilization of financial resources from all sources, but we also need to channel existing resources toward natural positive outcomes. And um, I think here is where the, where the domestic resources are very key. And uh, to do that, um, there are some, some several uh, possible ways to think about, but first, I think so. It, it, it has been highlighted uh, um, earlier: is the need to 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 the need for institutional reforms, policy reforms, and as as Mete, Mete said, um, policy coherence to improve the mobilization of domestic resources. And, and one tool that can be further developed, it already exists, but I think it is maybe not enough uh, developed. Is um, is the, the, the development of payment for ecosystem services that constitute a powerful tool to, to deal with what our CEO used to call uh, the, the market failure, which strongly, which wrongly uh, makes activities destroying nature more profitable than sustainable activities. Um, and to do that also, one key element is uh, the, the fact to the need to secure land tenure and the right of local people. We spoke about uh, private sector engagement. Also, it's uh, it's very much uh, very much needed. And here, maybe we could. Uh, of course, we need to further incentivize and work with the private sector at landscape and with jurisdiction level. But here, there is something that maybe we could try to develop even more: is the blended finance. And and, and Jeff has an experience on uh, with uh, through its uh, non-grant instrument uh, window uh, on blended finance. And I think this is something that can be also explored and, um, and developed. And then also uh, another point is at, at international level uh, that we need also to, to, to further valorize forest. Uh, there are many commitments uh, that need to be now translated into implementation. And in particular, as we got to, to Red Plus, the many countries have included Red Plus in their strategies, in their indices. 
but so far there are a lot of efforts uh, have helped to to improve uh, enabling conditions. But the social and ecological outcomes of these initiatives have stayed somehow limited, and the future of this process is still uncertain. And that's why, in this regard, a positive outcome in the negotiation uh, of the Article Six of the uh, Paris Agreement uh, at the next UNFCCC COP will be very important to 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 move in the right uh, right direction. And in any case, uh, whatever we we consider as financial mechanism, cooperation and synergies among the existing financial mechanisms are, are crucial. And the GEF is strongly engaged in that way to make the best possible use of existing uh, resources. As you mentioned, uh, Tim, uh, the GEF is a is a very important partnership because of its by its own definition, it's. Uh, a uh, partnership of 183 country members, 18 specialized organizations, including uh, some CPF members and, and other kind of partners, uh, including private, private sector. Jeff is a, a CPF member. So the Jeff mandate uh, uh, as financial mechanism of se several uh, multilateral uh, environmental agreement is, uh, is very unique because it's very um, powerful to put together all the different uh, aspects of, uh, of the environment and the forest have, uh, because of their integrated essence, have logically been a key element in the Jeff strategy since the beginning. Uh, Jeff <clears throat> supports the global agenda on forests, such as the implementation of NDC, the Bond Challenge, the LDN, the uh, UN strategic plan for forests. Just uh, in a nutshell, Jeff is about $1 billion per year, including 150, 200 million for forests. Ninety percent of these uh, resources uh, are grants. Um, so yes, it's, it's maybe relatively small as compared to the scale that we need. But uh, the Jeff impact comes from this ability to bring together all these partnerships: governments, international organizations, civil society, private sector, uh, so that we can support innovative solutions that can be scaled up. And also. But, uh... Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry, Pascal. I, I would like to link what you're saying to a point Meta made in her presentation. 50 to 150 billion dollars are lost mostly to developing country governments in revenue because of illegal deforestation. So this is more than the entire official development of assistance in the world by some estimates. I mean, 50 to 150 billion is a pretty wide margin, but it is a lot of money. So Clearly, uh, your point on mobilizing domestic finance um, is essential. There's a question in the chat that came up that I would like you to look at. And if, again, we have time, I'll come back to you. But otherwise, maybe you can answer it in the chat on smallholder finance. How do we channel, in particular, money to smallholder farmers who can be accused of being agents of deforestation? And this is a, a problem in Cote d'Ivoire, in, uh, in Ghana, and other countries where um, the, the smallholder farmers could be part of the solution, but they're often seen or are part of the problem. So if you could um, also the other panelists have a, help me uh, view the questions that are coming now into the chat. That's very good from the audience. Um, we'll move on to IUCN. And again, I'd like to make the point repeat the point Meta made about finance and the money that is currently being siphoned out of forests for, through the illegal activities. If we take the estimate for the UN decade on ecosystem restoration that around $1 trillion between now and 2030 would be needed to turn deforestation and other land degradation around, this is without the oceans on land, IUCN is the champion of the bond challenge on forest and landscape restoration. So um, Adriana, can I turn to you now with the question that focuses on building back better? We live through an unprecedented um, phase in our lives where each of us are in some way or another affected and impacted by COVID-19, which poses a lot of problems, but also holds some opportunities in terms of building back better from that pandemic, including through stimulus measures. So from IUCN's perspective, uh, Adriana, and the Bond Challenge perspective, 
what actions and tools could be developed to enhance private sector investments into forest and landscape restoration projects? And how could we use the building back better window after COVID-19 to really promote forest and landscape restoration? Thank you, Tim, for the question and for inviting us to, to share some um, ideas with the audience and with all of you. Um, indeed, we see um, um, huge potential for increasing private sector investment in forest landscape restoration, which, by the way, is um, a very comprehensive and holistic approach uh, and nature-based solution. Um, so that starts with improving companies' operations. For instance, you, we have heard um, many uh, calls and, and pledges for net zero targets or biodiversity targets across the, the company's value chain and operations. We have seen um, um, organiz uh, hundreds of companies, if not thousands of, thousands of companies, making pledges to, to, to achieve these net zero targets in many of them in, uh, operating in the forest and land use sector. So uh, what we know is that um, in order to implement these, these pledges, uh, they need to decarbonize their value chains and operations, as well as in investing in nature-based solutions such as FLR, so that landscape approaches and uh, restoration and conservation activities are implemented across the board. Uh, for companies beyond carbon offsetting, um, private sector investment in forest and landscape restoration can be counted as a financial and a mitigation uh, contribution to countries and disease, for instance. So there is definitely there the, the opportunity of uh, collaboration between private sector and governments to um, enhance ambition on, on uh, actions to restore and, and conserve landscape. Um, as to the role of governments to scale up investment in FLR, the first critical way, and um, we heard that from Pascal, is uh, by integrating restoration investments into national budget uh, and national accounting practices. Uh, um, there is data and, and, and science that um, shows that forest landscape restoration activity, sustainable forestry management is, uh, proves its capacity to provide a positive return on investment. Uh, from government funds spent. So um, it's just that uh, um, to, to do this and to you know, mainstream these activities in national budgets. But most importantly, the role of governments to provide an adequate policy and regulatory enabling environment that allows uh, for private sector investment is fundamental. We are talking about uh, clarity on land tenure issues, access and rights, access to markets, and policy harmonization to ensure that there are no policies or incentives that promote deforestation, land conversion, or uh, degradation. And um, you will see the CPF um, key messages, and, um, and this is one of the, uh, the fundamental uh, actions that need to be done. Other successful measures include tax incentives for green investments or carbon taxes to be reinvested in restoration activities. Um, uh, in, for instance, in the case of, of Colombia, which is a great example. In the case of, of technologies uh, for investment, there is a great opportunity to work with the private sector on expanding the use of monitoring and financial, financial technologies like um, artificial intelligence, blockchain, for instance. With these measures um, that the government could promote, um, um, there is a, a concrete chance to risk, reduce the risk of investment and provide the right market infrastructure. One last thing that I'll say regarding private sector is, um, and I think many of us are um, familiar with the Dasgupta report, uh, 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 and was mentioned before that the, um, financials, the financial sector needs to internalize the cost of environmental risks to their operations, but as well as the impact of their own operations into nature. So um, the idea is that there is this uh, two-way uh, assessment of, of the impact of, uh, to nature from private sector operations, and that is expected to trigger the redirection of capital towards uh, better, better practices and nature-based solutions investment. 
Um, and just one um, idea to, to touch upon your the, um, what you mentioned, Tim, about the connection between private sector investment or, or investment in, in uh, recovery efforts. Um, we know that um, there are many short-term uh, job and employment opportunities um, for, uh, to recover from this uh, crisis. And their um, nature-based solutions can generate as a matter of fact, can generate immediate employment and income opportunities. Examples of this um, include land uh, and seascapes ecosystem restoration, forestry, community-based management, and green and gray infrastructure. Um, and I'll share with you uh, some numbers under the barometer of restoration progress uh, for the implementation of bond challenge pledges. We tracked that the US forest restoration program um, worked on 2.3 million hectares on land between 2010 and 2019, generating nearly $2 billion in local labor income, supporting an average of 5,400 jobs annually. So um, the evidence is there. Um, I think investments need to be uh, redirected um, from the whole uh, package of, of COVID recovery to um, more green and resilient um, activities. Thank you so much, Adriana. And um, following on your last point, UNEP launched a report a few weeks ago where we looked at the $15 trillion of economic stimulus, and only 18% of that could be classified as somehow being green. So there's certainly quite a ways to go and a lot of opportunities. And of course, the figures on job creation from investments in restoration, but also in sustainable forest industries are important in this regard so that we make sure governments know that these are good investments that not only return economic value, but value for social capital and natural capital as well. And in that context, um, you mentioned uh, the private disclosures. There is also good news that a task force on nature related disclosures is starting to have the same systematic approach to this as the task force on carbon disclosures had for the climate space in for the private sector and for the governments, of course, now all the governments can use the official system of environmental and economic accounting to register their national wealth at the UN statistics division. So we now have a measure, although few countries are using it yet, but more and more are coming that clearly goes beyond GDP as a measure of what is really the national wealth. So if your natural capital goes up or down, the Minister of Finance will see that just like they now see whether GDP goes up or down. These are the kinds of changes that might not make the headlines, but that move the needle. So um, again, thanks for that insight also into the one challenge in particular that is a champion activity also under the UN decade on ecosystem restoration that we're now in. I would like to come next to Maria Del Mar Moso Buriel. Maria is director at the Director of Forest Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services in Colombia. And of course, Colombia being a mega diverse country uh, with a lot of forests and successes in the fight against deforestation. What I would like to ask you, Maria, is what are the most promising approaches that you've seen in Colombia? And in particular, what role do indigenous people's local communities, women and youth groups play uh, in that effort to turn the tide on deforestation? OK, hi, Phil. Good afternoon to all. Um... Thank you for the invitation. And as you say, there's around 60 million hectares of forest in the country. We are a mega diverse country and 52% of the continental surface are forest. But the, uh, and as you say, that is a very, very difficult um, region, but we Colombia, the government of Colombia is highly highly committed to reduce deforestation. We have set an ambitious target in our updated national determined contribution of reducing emission by 52% by 20 and 30, and reduce deforestation play a center role in the meet this target. So the data of the national monitoring system shows that 
the trend of deforestation start to decline from two, uh, 2013 uh, to 2016. So the recent increase of deforestation in 2017, mainly in the Amazon region, after the peace agreement signature challenged our actions. You know that. So, um, so we found that our approach settled in, uh, out in the Amazon vision that aims to progressively reduce deforestation while promoting sustainable development in the region is effective. We saw that trends start to decline again from 18 uh, after nowadays we are going down. Um, so we are doing very good in uh, getting all those goals complete. So our vision Amazonia, I'm telling you is a program which proposed a model of sustainable development for the Amazon. This initiative empowers local population and articulates economic and social sectors to promote the quality of life. It promotes biodiversity conservation, productivity, and recognizes the limitations and opportunity of the region. It recovers the indigenous practice, the indigenous people for conservation, and for sustainability of the territory, and strengthens the local institutions. So it's very, very complete, the program. And we are very, um, very pleased of what the results are going on in that in that path. And the support we are having a support of Germany, Norway, and UK through the Red Early Movers, the and the Green Climate Fund through the results-based payment pilot programming for Red Plus. There are key pieces to achieve this uh, ambitious target. We know that without international help and this pressure, this, not, this won't be complete. So, and we also know that indigenous people and Afro-descendant communities are also a key part of the solution. We know that and they, and we, they also um, own more than 50% of the natural forest land, uh, forest land in the country. So in that context, for example, in the Amazon vision program that I just told about, um, on the basis of a consultation process, the priorities of indigenous people were included and they include um, territory and environment. We also include indigenous self-government, economy and production, strengthening the indigenous women and cross-current issues. So um, the resources from, from the red early movers are, are in these projects have been assigned to ensure those priorities to be implemented. So the project has been doing a great job. We still have a lot of um, issues, but we tried because uh, you know the insecurity in Colombia is very is a is a threat, and we're all, we're aware historically that forests and indigenous are tribal territories that have suffered much less destruction than the regions in the other forests. But nowadays with all what's going on in the country, uh, are very, a lot of factors that are protected this forest are, are very weak nowadays. So with the Vision and Mass uh, program, we are aiming to contribute to strengthening communal, communal territory rights. So uh, compensating the indigenous people for uh, environmental services, the payment for services that we'll talk about, not just in the indigenous uh, regions, but in the older community. We are aiming to that uh, compensating the, the environmental services very strong in the country. So another point we are re 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 revitalizing traditional cultures and knowledge. So we, talk, we, we work with these cultures and their knowledge, we don't work with um, something different. And we try to strengthen territorial governments, governance and indigenous and tribal organizations. So this is a little what we are trying to do in the country in order to halt the deforestation. And we know that we have many other actions to implement and with the local and the laws within the country. We have, for example, um, uh, Conal Def, which is a which is which is a 
uh, from from the presidential level institute that guards the entire country and they, they said monitoring and another kind of measures to to help us uh, fight against the deforestation and we're not fighting just against the gorilla and we're fighting against deforestation as well so that's um we are very very compromised in those in all those um uh, those things that we're doing to halt deforestation in the country that's Thank you very much, Maria. And indeed, um, thanks for highlighting the role of indigenous peoples, local communities, and the effectiveness that um, indigenous managed territories in the Amazon and elsewhere can uh, have as a protection measure against deforestation. And also, thanks for highlighting Red Plus. I mean, as the UN Red Program, FAO, UNDP, UNEP, we've been with you for part of that way, at least. Uh, same for Ghana and many other countries. Um, so it's good to see that the readiness is now over and we need to scale up. I think um, everybody's, everybody's ready <laughs> to scale up and the finance is coming as we heard from Zach Goldsmith with Project LEAF that was launched at the US uh, Summit on Climate. So um, we have a few minutes left and I try to um, accommodate some of the questions from the audience. Um, Mette, can I ask you and the others to for very brief responses, there was a question of turning voluntary standards into laws and the role of um, flagged tea and other efforts um, to curb illegal deforestation. How do you see uh, that as an avenue of turning the tide? Thank you, uh, Tim. And I saw the question and was about to answer it, but certainly the forest law enforcement governance and trade that, that we are promoting and helping to promote legal and sustainable value change, wood value change, is very important to help reduce illegal logging and making sure that we provide livelihoods to those that are dependent on forest. But we should also keep in mind that it is not actually the illegal logging that's the biggest driver of deforestation. It is expansion of agriculture. It is cutting down the wood to replace some other crops on the land. So people are not that interested in getting certification for that wood because most of it is actually going to be just burnt. Uh, so it will help address some aspects of it, but it won't on its own turn the tide on deforestation. But it's one of the tools in the toolbox and we should certainly make use of that too. Indeed, and even on agricultural commodities, the EU and others are working on stricter uh, imports to reduce their food print on forests and other ecosystems. Uh, there are a couple of questions on smallholder finance and one of them directed to, to Roslyn. Maybe you can take that and then followed by Pascal, if both of you can reflect in particular on smallholder farmers of which there are almost a billion in the world and every third job is in agriculture. How do we help these people be friends of the forests rather than having to burn it down to make a living? Thank you very much, Tim. Um, so I saw one of the questions on the fact that the smallholders are the contributors or drivers in, in some instances to deforestation. So how do we convince private sector to still invest? Um, the point is private sector is engaging smallholders already in one way or the other, either directly or indirectly. So that engagement is already there. What we have to do now is to build the confidence in that engagement. And that's why I really value the the process um, we have gone through in the Red Plus mechanism, the fact that we've invested so much on governance um, structures. When you have these governance structures, we are bringing every stakeholder on board and we are all around the same table, um, putting across our interests, putting across what our challenges are, putting across what our fears are in some instances, and then coming up together with solutions that um, support each and every stakeholder to um, understand what it means for their interest or for their benefits um, to be achieved. So we can easily do that, but we need to do that in a very transparent and inclusive manner where each stakeholder is confident of the fact that I am coming to the table and my benefits will not be compromised. There wouldn't be any elite capture of my benefits eventually. And, um, and private sector is okay, smallholders are okay. And also 
to the point where we support um, smallholders to diversify their income sources. Another strength of Red Plus in Ghana, not just focusing on their farming, there are other of farm activities that they can engage in to diversify their income sources. And we have examples in Ghana where wherever this has been promoted, the farmers have kept up the, the, the forest because in the absence of um, further income to cater for their families, in some instances, large families, then they would have to depend on the forest. But if you're able to diversify and give them viable um, alternative and additional livelihoods that they can add to whatever they are doing, it helps. Um, I guess this might be the last time I'm speaking. So just to chip this in that um, in the work that we are doing, we realize that there is a huge challenge of bureaucracy, which we, we hardly talk about. Now, even with the limited funding that we have coming to the forestry sector um, or for nature-based solutions, even with that little percentage of our 2%, there is too much bureaucracy. And um, going back to the fact that the CPF um, has been, it's, it's made up of members of all the entities we engage with, the World Bank is in there, UNFCCC is in there. Can we reduce the bureaucracy to some extent, not just at the international level, but then also nationally? Because you realize that for some small funding that should get to a smallholder to make impact, the levels of bureaucracy are just too much. Even for me, at times I get a, a bit impatient. I think that we have come way too far. We should believe and trust in the people within the landscape that they can put their own resources to very good use. We do not need too many managers. We do not need too many checkpoints. I am not saying we shouldn't be transparent or accountable, but at a certain point, whilst we are being bureaucratic, deforestation is not bureaucratic. Somebody gets into the forest and is destroying. COVID-19 was not bureaucratic. It just came and we have to grapple with it. So we have to think about the different bureaucracies that we put in our technical and financing support channels. We should reduce them, possibly have a research environment where there's a control. In that control, we don't do anything. And let's analyze what it is when we don't do anything and when we have all these bureaucracies and how it eventually pans out. I think that we have a great potential. We should be able to reduce these bureaucracies. Appreciate what is already going on in countries, in landscapes that are thriving, that are um, putting all their, their efforts in there and also try to encourage and motivate people to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosalind. We, we certainly live in a time in history when it's good to become a little bit impatient. Uh, so well done for that. I fully subscribe to your call to reduce bureaucracy. Pascal, does the GF have tools to uh, use blockchain to replace uh, all this bureaucracy and quickly and effectively monitor smallholder finance? Thank you, Tim. Uh, actually, we, we are beginning to introduce in our GF8 thinking uh, the possibility, uh, uh, but it's still in, in being negotiated because we are at the beginning of the process to to to, uh, to to incorporate new technologies and blockchain are one of them in, to to improve the traceability and 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 uh, the track of the data. So so this is something that it is in, in our in 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 a, in a possibility, but we have not yet experience on the field. Uh, this it would be more in the future, but to to. To respond to your to your first question regarding the, the small orders, uh, actually this is what we are trying to to focus on very strongly uh, because it's it's uh, <clears throat> again what what I was beginning at the beginning uh, at my, my, uh, what I was saying sorry at the beginning in my intervention is uh, regarding the the value of nature. It's about uh, being able to, to 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 demonstrate that another economic model is possible for for the small orders, and we have many uh, different kind of activities that we support in our, in our programs. And especially this program on the food system, land use and restoration, the biggest program of Jeff seven and Ghana is one of the countries uh, participating in one of the seven, 27 countries participating in this, uh, uh, in this program. And it's about empowering uh, small order. It's about um, connecting them with the, with the market. It's about uh, helping them to, to diversify their production. It's about uh, sustainable intensification of, of their production. So it's a mix of several uh, variety of activities uh, and all aiming at uh, bringing them to another level and to improve their, their livelihood so that they, they, they don't need to, to go further in the, in the forest. So yes, indeed, we, we, are, we are working uh, strongly on that and it's part of our strategy to, to combat diversification to help smallholders to, to, better, uh, to better use land. 
Thank you, Pascal. Um, and uh, I see Eva Miller from the German government is ready to close our event. Before that, maybe um, Maria and Adriana, if I may come to you for very quick answers. One is a question on Red Plus. Maybe Maria, your best place to answer that. The Red Plus pilot project of GCF has already run out. How can Red Plus countries now receive payments for their results from a country that is also working on this with various programs. Maria, please, you can hopefully share some insights on that. Well, we have been working with the community. Um, so uh, we go in within the, in the field, they do, well, we have the land support and we also pay for the environmental um, guard for the, for example, for the indigenous people. We have been working with them, so they do a model where we can go with uh, within and work with them and pay them for what they are doing for conservation. So for that, uh, it's very technical, and I, I just know the little basis, but. We are working uh, with around the whole country, not just in the Amazon with the indigenous people. We are around the whole country doing this payment for the communities that are working in, a cons in the conservation process of uh, how the deforestation and changing the, the fact that they are before they were used in the land differently and now they're using it for the right, uh, for the right uh, path. So that are working with the, the environmental authorities within the different regions and with them working together and um, with our, our path, we were doing a great job with that. Thank you. And I hope the FAO team can also perhaps answer uh, that other part of the question that came in. Where is the finance for Red Plus actually coming from? Or where could it come from? Public, private sources, uh, Project LEAF, et cetera. So maybe FAO can share some information about that after the event with those who asked. Um, Adriana, can I um, ask you for a very quick statement on turning the tide, which means not only halting deforestation, but reversing deforestation and restoring forests and other ecosystems. If the bond challenge could change uh, one thing, what would that be to come to the 350 million hectares that are committed by 2030? Um not change but redouble on um on efforts that meta described very well at the beginning of the of the event collective efforts um it is it has become obvious that um progress only happens and implementation on the ground only happens when a multiplicity of actors are aligned towards uh, same objective so it is not only a matter of reaching out to a particular sector of the government or a particular um, level, but it, it has to be um, an effort that grow, goes across the board um, all levels of government. And as Rosalyn was, was explaining from their experience in Ghana, really investing in governance structures um, and connecting with the people who work on the ground, who make restoration possible, as well as um, the private sector who are who are already there. And um, particularly in this current international context, I think the opportunities have uh, expanded now that companies are um, more and more willing to invest in nature-based solutions as a way of um, expanding their impact uh, positive impact towards uh, nature, whether they are working on the forest and land use sector or not. So we have to find this common ground uh, to expand the, 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 the types of actors that are involved into um, and, you know, advanced action. Thank you for that strong call for collaboration and collective action. And Generation Restoration is on the move for the UN decade, as you know, which you are a special part of. So with this, I would like to hand over the floor to Dr. Eva Müller, who is Director General for Forests, Sustainability and Renewable Resources at the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Eva, very good to see you and thank you for agreeing to close this event. Please, the floor is yours. Um, first of all, can you hear me well? Yes, loud and clear. 
Okay, great, because I had some technical problems and I know I'm now on my iPhone. Okay, thank you for inviting me to this side event. Um, this is very interesting for me because it's sort of a follow up to the international conference working across sectors to hold deforestation and increased forest area that the CPF organized in 2018. And for me personally, that particular conference is also very important because at the time I was the FAO forestry director and I was deeply involved in the organization of the conference, as you may remember. And um, Germany was also one of the co-founders of the conference, which to me demonstrates the importance the topic of halting deforestation has for us. So I'd like to first congratulate the CPF for continuing and strengthening the work in this area, building on the outcomes and the key messages of the conference. And I would also like to thank, of course, the panelists in this side event for their insights and their really inspiring contributions to the discussion of this important topic. For the 2018 conference, we used as a subtitle from aspiration to action. And we did this because we strongly believe that halting deforestation and increasing forest area urgently needed scaling up and accelerating action beyond the usual silos. And this is still needed now because uh, the SDG target 15.2 on halting deforestation by 2020 has not been achieved. So Germany, therefore very much appreciates the Secretary General's call to scale up action on turning the tide on deforestation. And as a donor and also as a member of a number of multilateral initiatives, we have been very active in developing, supporting and implementing creative and innovative initiatives to accelerate action. And we have also continuously supported the CPF. In Germany, we have developed national guidelines for sustainable and deforestation free supply chains. And we have set up a dedicated platform for all stakeholders along the supply chain for these, uh, to implement these guidelines. And last year, when we chaired the Amsterdam partnership, we pushed for joint engagement of European governments to achieve sustainable and deforestation free supply chains of agricultural and forest products. With the CPF and jointly with FAO, we have organized a series of so-called donor meetings to help mobilize support for innovative and synergetic CPF actions in the framework of CPF's work plan. And we have also actively supported about half a dozen CPF initiatives and activities. We have promoted strategic developments within the CPF. We have co-financed a dedicated associate professional officer at FAO for the CPF and have always advocated for coherent action in the respective governing bodies of the CPF members. Now we are in 2021 in the time when the world is in an exceptional crisis due to the pandemic. And we do more than ever see the need for concerted engagement of governments, the private sector and civil society to create the right policy and fiscal frameworks to achieve the transformational change in food systems, to strive for more sustainable agricultural value chains or to build back better after the pandemic. We in Germany strongly believe in the enormous potential the forest-based solutions have to address global challenges for the quadruple planetary emergency crisis as stated in the CPF statement. And while it is great to see all this new motivation most recently at the Earth Day Summit of last week, we believe that it's only through coherent and concerted action that all those actors together will be able to hold deforestation. And this for us is why the collaborative partnership on forests is of paramount importance because its core function is to enhance coherence, cooperation, as well as policy and program coordination at all levels 
and it can make significant contributions through its joint initiatives. Let me finish with a quote of Albert Einstein, who said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. So I call on you to use the opportunity of the existing crisis and this super year of nature we're having to comply with the UN decade of action and make use of forest-based solutions. So let us together finally bring deforestation to an end. And I thank you. And we will, or deforestation will bring us to an end. So thank you very much, Eva. We don't have a choice and we have to turn the tide. Thank you very much to FAO for organizing this very informative event. Uh, thank you for this fantastic panel, for our guest speaker from the UK, for Germany for the closing remarks and thank you to all the participants and to the technical staff at FAO and a particular thanks to Mette as the new chair of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, which will become even more collaborative with you at the helm, Mette. And with that, thank you all and good evening, good night or a good rest of the day, wherever you may be. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.